If you've got your Bible, I'd like to ask you to open to Ephesians chapter 2. Bob, when I was sitting there, I took the deep breaths. I can't tell that it made a lot of difference. My thoughts are not any clearer than they were. I appreciate the invitation that uh, Garden extended this past Tuesday. And uh, just wanted to share something that's been on my heart, something that I've been thinking about and studying for quite some time now. Kind of illustrate the point. Recently, I heard a preacher talking about the fact that he took up bicycling. Obviously, it wasn't me. But he was trying to uh, kind of fit in, and he bought all the equipment and the spandex and the shoes and, and the whole thing. And after <clears throat> he had been riding for a while, a friend of his called and said, well, we're having a big ride. There's going to be about 50 of us. And you know the crowds. They're the one that there's 50 or 75 of them, and it blocks traffic. That, if you're one of those, I'm sorry. But <clears throat> and he was asked to join that crowd, and he said, but there's one thing about it. He said, are you still bicycling with your running shoes? He said, yeah. He said, well, these people are kind of, I don't know how to say it, snobby about it. There's evidently a special shoe that you're supposed to have riding that's got a little clip on the bottom of your shoe and it hooks into the pedal. Now that sounds like a recipe for disaster to me. But on one side of the pedal, it's got where you can lock in, and on the other side, it's just a regular paddle. Well, he said, there's no way I'm gonna do that, but he bought the pair of shoes anyway. And so when he got into the group, he acted like he was clipping in. And I guess whenever you're going to get out of it, you stop at a stop sign or something like that, you have to throw your heel out. So every stop sign, every red light, he kicked his heel out like he was unlocking it. And he said, when I got back home, I thought about the foolishness of what I had just done. I was pretending to be something that I'm not in order to be accepted. We seldom do that, don't we? I read in a book some time ago about three preachers that were at a conference and they were standing around talking at a break. One of them asked the other, said, <clears throat> how's your church doing? Well, for those of you that, that don't speak preacherese, that means how many of you are having in attendance? And he said, oh, we're having about a thousand. He said, and what about you? He said, well, the Lord has really blessed us. We're having around 15, around 1,500. The third preacher is kind of feeling pressure and beads of sweat are popping out on his head. And he said, here I am. These guys are big churches. And I, they're not going to accept me if, you know, I'm not in the group. And I only preach for a church of around 250. And he heard a little voice that said, 300 sounds so much better than 250. And so when they finally got around to ask him, he said, how many at your church? He said, 2,000. <laughs> we do that, don't we, in so many ways. We want to be accepted. We want to be approved of. And we don't feel like what we've done or what we are is good enough. There's a book about the disease of perception management, if you can believe how we manage the way you view me. The way you view me. And I'm willing to make all kinds of compromises, and we don't like to call it lying, but I'll misrepresent the truth in order to make you think better of me, to think that I'm smarter than I really am. Well, we can't make you think I'm better looking than I am, but maybe richer than I really am. All kinds of things we go through in order to manipulate perception. Why do we pretend? Pretending is exhausting, isn't it? It's a lot like lying. It just wears you out. And the older you get, the harder it is to lie because you have to remember what you lied about so you can cover for it over and over and over again. <laughs> We feel that we should have been more than we are. Pretending is trying to make ourselves look 
like we're something that we're not because God didn't do his job very well. Pretense is a result of seeking to manipulate how you value me. And when we have an over-concern, isn't that what peer pressure is about? Isn't that what the kids struggle with in school? They want to be accepted and will do virtually anything to be accepted. We do that. We're all guilty of it in some way or another, to one degree or another. But what if I were to tell you that there's a passage of Scripture that if you really gain a hold of it, if you really get a grasp of what this really says, what it really means, you'll never have to pretend again. And that passage is found in Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to, to read that passage. In Ephesians 2, Paul obviously is talking about the relationship that we have in Christ and how we develop that relationship. And he wants us to know that we are saved. I kind of grew up with the idea, well, I think I'm saved. I'm pretty sure. I hope so. But I wasn't really all that confident. Let's read beginning in chapter 2 of Ephesians with verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit that is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who have lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's our condition. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that in order that in the coming ages he might show the un incomparable riches of his grace he raised us up for what purpose that he might show his incomparable riches that are expressed in his grace expressed in his kindness to our, toward us in Christ Jesus for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith and that is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. Now we're going to key in on verse 10 tonight. There's an interesting word found in, in verse 10. He said, you are God's workmanship. That comes from the Greek word poime. Poeme, translated from which we get the word poem or poet. And that word is only found twice in the New Testament. I want to kind of develop that with you tonight. Poeme means something made. And in context, it's something made by God himself. Every time that word is used, twice in the New Testament, twice in the Old Testament, from the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament and it shows up only twice and in all four instances it's something that God does he is the artist he is the poet and we are the poetry we're the poem it's kind of an interesting word I can't say poem without thinking of one of my granddaughters is nine years old she is fixated on it's not poem it's poem and so we have these extended conversations where I'll use poem as many times as I can, saying poem, and she corrects me with poem. But we are God's poem. We are his work. We are his uh, majestic uh, art. Poem means something made. In the context, God is in the process of making something. You and I are something that are in process. 
as a new creation, you are skillfully and artfully created in Christ Jesus. Look at those verses again. They're rich. To be his work of art. Have you ever thought of yourself as a poem, a piece of art, a sculpture? It's communicating the idea that God is seeing something that we've not seen yet. You're God's masterpiece. You're his poem. You're his piece of art. When we look at ourselves in this way, we begin to understand the incredible value that God places on you, each one of us. You know, when Michelangelo looked at a boulder, he could see something that nobody else saw. When I look at a boulder, I see a rock. I see dirt on it. I see, you know, that it doesn't have a regular form. And one time in the writings about Michelangelo, they said he was standing there looking at a boulder, and he just stared. And someone asked him, said, what do you see? What are you looking at? He, see, I, he said, I see an angel trying to get free. I see a boulder. I see a rock. Michel Michelangelo saw an angel. He saw the statue of Jesus sitting in the lap of Mary. He saw so many great works. Artists look at a canvas. I see a white piece of canvas. They see a masterpiece just waiting to be painted. And that's what's being communicated here in this section. C.S. Lewis said it this way. We are a divine work of art if Rembrandt's artistic masterpieces have great undisputable value would not God's one-of-a-kind human masterpieces convey even greater value if you don't get anything else out of the lesson tonight I hope that you understand that God is communicating in these verses that we have great value that you are very important to God that is uh, valuable as Rembrandt and Michelangelo and all of their works together are. You are a piece of art. You're a poem made by God himself. Timothy Keller says, do you not know what it means that you are God's workmanship? What is art? It's beautiful. It's valuable art expression of the inner being of the maker of the artist it comes from within the artist imagine what it means you're beautiful you're valuable and you're an expression of the very inner being of the artist the divine artist God himself God is taking his inner values God is taking who he is on the inside, his creativity. That creativity, if you'll go to the next slide, that creati creativity made the world. And when we look at the world that God made, have you ever stood at the edge of the ocean and listened to the waves come in, the power, the majesty? Have you ever gone up to the mountains and looked out over the valley and said, unbelievably beautiful. It had to be God. And so, if you look at Romans chapter 1, verse 20, God is expressing something when he uses the word for the second time. He said, God says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been seen, being understood from what has been made. Guess what that word is? What has been made, four English words, one Greek word, poema. Poema. This is God's masterpiece. We look at the oceans. Show the other two slides if you would. We look at the, what has God created. He said, look at it. 
Look at what I've made. Look at my poema. And see my power. Look at the majesty. Look at the power. Look at the beauty. And he says, that's my poema. And there are certain things about me that you ought to know by what has been made. My eternal qualities. I don't know how anyone goes to the mountains and look at those majestic views and not say, this has to be God. This has to be his work. And I'm sure there are scenes that are coming to mind, various places that you've been around the world and think, incredibly beautiful. That's God's poema. And the only other time that word is used is when God in Ephesians chapter 2 says of you and I, you are my poema. You are my masterpiece. But we struggle with that. We look in the mirror and we don't see a beautiful poem. And we compare ourselves to one another. And we saw so many people that are so much more attractive than we are. They appear to be so much more intelligent than we are. They're more successful than we are. And we compare ourselves and put ourselves down and say, I'm just not very valuable. But let's kind of put that in context. God said, you're my workmanship. And the reason we don't feel valuable, the reason we don't feel worthy, the reason we don't feel as good as is because we're comparing our work, what we do. No, I can't do it. But did you notice in Ephesians chapter 2, he said, for by grace have you been saved through faith, that not of yourself. I can't save myself. But God did through Christ. And he said, in Christ, in this relationship, you are a beautiful piece of art. And I'm not through with you yet. I'm still working on you. I'm still chipping away. But you know what God can see? You know what God can see in me? The finished product. He can see the beautiful soul, life, influence that he wants me to be. And so I don't need to compare myself to you. I don't need to compare myself to others because I am God's workmanship. That's kind of a hard concept, I think, for us to really get a handle on. I'm going to, do something, I'm going to ask you to do something to be a little uncomfortable. I'd like for you to repeat that after me because that's really what God is saying. I want you to understand. So would you say with me, I am God's workmanship. I am God's wonder. I am God's art. I am his poem. If we can get a grasp of that, I don't have to be as, sing as well as John Scott, although I probably do. I don't have to, I can't sing like, I envy that guy. I, I'm ashamed of that, but I am. And I'm not as rich as someone, or I'm not as intelligent as someone. But you know what? God made me unique. I'd say different, but I'd get too many amens out of that. God made me distinct from anyone else. And he has a purpose and a plan for my life that no one else can fulfill. And God, through the years, has been working on you. He's been working on me to bring me to the point that I am now. But in his eyes, he said, you're my beautiful poem. You're the greatest piece of art that's ever been made. You're my pride and my joy. Oftentimes, he'll use different things to chip away. If you just think of a piece of rock, a chisel and a hammer, and the artist, 
God uses different things to chip away the rough spots because he knows what's there. He looks at that canvas, and I see maybe a blank canvas, maybe a few, piece, a few blots of paint from here and there. But the artist knows, and the artist can bring it to life. And you see slowly the picture developing. That's what God is doing. He starts making a poem. I know there are bad poems. They're good poems. But this is God's poem, and God doesn't make bad poems. And so when we find ourselves being overly critical or when we find ourselves feeling the need to develop or manage perception, trying to make ourselves better, trying to make ourselves more spiritual by inflating numbers, by the way in which we try to represent ourselves, just realize that you're God's masterpiece. What can be better than that? And I can't be like you. I don't walk your path. And so he says, I want you to understand that I am making you into the person I want you to be. He talks about us being conformed to the image of Christ. Do you really believe that? In Romans 8 and verse 29, he said, Be not conformed to the world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is a part of the process, folks. What we're talking about tonight is part of that process of renewing your mind, realizing the value that you have to God. And if we don't believe that, why in the world would he have sent his son for trash? Why would he have sent his son for something that's not of any value? How important are you to God? The value of something is what I'm, worth, I'm willing to pay for it, isn't it? I've got a, well, about two-thirds of a bottle of water up here, and I, I can let it go for $100. Do I have any takers? Charlie Johnson? Uh, no. Why? Because it's not worth it. We place a value on something, and we'll pay for it if it's worth it. God said, you are so important. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not when we were worthy, not when we got it all together, not when we became spiritual. While we were yet sinners, while I was still in my sin, Jesus died for me. How valuable are you? What was the purchase price? the blood of Jesus Christ. You are as valuable as what was paid for you. And how do you think God valued the blood, the life of his son? I am so thankful, so appreciative that God not only created me, but he recreates me. I was not only born, but I was reborn. I was born again to become God's workmanship. Let's look at Ephesians 2 again. I want to read verse 10 one more time. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. I am created in Christ Jesus. I am being shaped. I am the poem that is yet fully written. I am the piece of art that has yet been painted. I am the sculptor. I am the sculptee that has not yet been fully sculpted. But I am created for good works. I am God's Poeme. He is the poeme. So many times we don't really understand 
the relationship that we have with God. In Isaiah chapter 29, he says, who do you think you are? He said, God is the potter and you are the clay. He says, we can't say to God, you have no value. The potter is the one who makes the clay. He said, we are his work. And so he says, I want you to understand the majestic relationship that you and I have. Now I understand why David could say, I will praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works, guess what word that is? Poeme. Your poem, your art, your sculptor is perfect. It's wonderful. And that's who you and I are. How many times have we sung that old song, Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness. John Scott, what's the next verse? Do you know? You're, stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Stamp your image. Folks, tonight, let's thank God that he is in the process of stamping his image, his love, his compassion, his concern, his sense of right and wrong, stamping it on my heart. Do we really believe that God is answering this prayer? Do we really believe that God is working in your life to create a masterpiece? Let's leave here tonight never comparing ourselves to anyone else. We're not like anyone else. Let's just be who God is making us into. Let's just be the person. Let's just be the magnificent person beautiful work that God intended us to be. Would you bow with me, please? Father, we want to thank you because we are wonderfully made. We are not a product of our own hands. But you are shaping and molding. You are painting. You are sculpting us into the blessing for a world that needs so badly to see the reflection of your image. Stamp thine own image deep on our heart. And Father, for those times that we try to be something we're not, forgive us. We pray for wisdom and we pray for the understanding that we don't have to compare ourselves with others, that we are unique, and that no matter what we look like, how talented we may be, that you are shaping us to fulfill a very unique and special role. And for that, Father, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.